Hello. Uh, I'll go right right into the interview, so you don't have to lose time, and I'll sort of uh, record the like the introduction afterwards, so so okay. we can make the most of, of of the time, right? So for uh, like. Before entering into your work and particularly in capitalism in the web of life, uh, how how did you get to get interested in the relations between capitalism and nature, uh, like um, economics and ecology? How 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 did you got the interest in in, in both things and in their relations? Well, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon during the 1970s and 80s and early 90s when I finally graduated from university. And it was a very politically uh, aware time. I grew up on, on the communist left. So for me, the questions of working class justice and dignity and power were fundamental. I was also in Oregon at really the height of second wave environmentalism and in which the conflict between the economy and the environment in the way that the political discourse was structured at the time was very much at the forefront of our thinking. And what I saw was a series of divisions within the left, one around working class and labor issues, another around environmentalism, and let's footnote for the moment that I'm not sure that environmentalism is really a left-wing movement. And then uh, movements against imperialism, especially against the uh, ongoing uh, uh, American support for the death squad regimes of Central America. Mm -hmm. Which of course is a labor and environmental question as well. However, none of those questions were really connected in any meaningful way. So, what I began to piece together in my days at university, and I was fortunate enough to meet uh, a very high profile and dynamic scholar, John Bellamy Foster, uh, who also shared this sensibility of the interconnection of class environmentalism and imperialism and anti-imperialism. I was fortunate to be able to begin to ask questions that moved across the intellectual, but as we know, also political and social movement boundaries of imperialism, class and capital, and the web of life. Okay, great. Uh, so there are many things to talk about. So let's start by going to the, like, the main theoretical points of capitalism in the web of life. Uh, the first, uh, like, theoretical point you stress is that we should finish with the with the rip with the division between nature and society uh, which has structured our thought and our knowledge for many many well at least two centuries uh, three centuries in 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 advance uh, you you say that this 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 uh, uh, this this division is is particularly harmful for, for eco political ecology, right? It's a great question. And the first connection I would make is that the central argument of Web of Life is really twofold. On the one hand, it addresses squarely the epistemological and philosophical questions of the alleged divide between civilization and savagery, which today is called the divide between society and nature. And I put it in these terms because this way of thinking was fundamental to the rise of capitalism. It takes shape during the rise of capitalism. And by the rise of capitalism, I do not mean uh, smart Englishmen with their coal and their steam engines in the 18th century, I mean in 1492 with the Iberian conquest and subsequent genocides and transformation of the Americas. That for, uh, for the Iberians and especially for Spain, 
the principle of metaphysical instrumentalism dominated, which held that for that indigenous peoples stood before the Christian Spaniards much as Spaniards uh, stood and other Christian subjects uh, stood before God. In other words, that indigenous peoples and the rest of nature were so-called imperfect nature. And it's here that we, this is indebted to the work of Orlando Betancourt. Uh, this is the origins of the great divide between civilization and savagery. Now, having said that, you can almost guess at the link that I'm going to make, which is that these are not merely epistemological questions. These are not merely academic or interpretive questions. These are questions of what I call ruling abstractions. Ruling abstractions is, a, is an idea that draws from Son, Riddle, and others on real abstraction. The value, for instance, under capitalism is a real abstraction that takes on a life of its own that is not real but takes on a reality. Well, civilization and savagery was the dominant set of ruling abstractions, that is, abstractions that were pivotal to bourgeois and imperial rule from the very beginning of capitalism. And this is strangely, in my view, this is what the critics of world ecology as a perspective and capitalism in the web of life as a book have universally missed, which is that the, the structure, the intellectual structure of civilization and savagery was in itself a conceptual and practical political hammer in the hands of imperialists and the emergent bourgeoisies of this era. In other words, to see the world in terms of nature and society is not only to see like an imperialist, it is also to reinforce the underlying epistemological and policy assumptions of imperialism from the very beginning. Now, the other argument of the book, which has been universally lost, is that history matters. And that the, the claims uh, that I make in Capitalism and the Web of Life and that Raj Patel and I make in A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things, not to mention countless articles and interviews, the central point that we make is that we need to come to grips with capitalism, the history of capitalism, not as some abstract theorization, but to understand that the origins and development of capitalism are about how power, production, and reproduction fit together in the web of life. It is, in other words, a, a project to incorporate uh, the worldwide class struggle under capitalism with the web of life, with structures of domination and power. And so, for instance, when I talk about the capitalist scene, which I know you will ask me about, but I will just say this up front, when I talk about the capitalist scene, I'm not talking only about an abstract world market, an abstract dynamic of capital accumulation. I am also talking about the structures of domination that made that possible. Above all, the world color line, globalizing patriarchy, and the Promethean sensibility of society that society dominates nature and can do with nature as it pleases. Looks to me like um, your book is one of the main uh, heritages of the wall systems uh, uh, theory, even if you change it, because of course your point of view is different from the one Arrighi and Ballestein use. And uh, you talk about the world ecology. Uh, it would be good if you could expand on that in just a detail. Well, maybe when you come to Spain, we can talk about that. But um, it's not for today. <laughs> but certainly, it's it's. Uh, a great difference that you acknowledge the Spanish cycle as a fully capitalist cycle because neither Palestine nor Arrighi do that. They, they, they focus on Genoa and, um, and Venice and the Fuggers as the, as the real capitalist uh, instances there. But in the way you remake this and you use the term world ecology allows you to also make a, a new uh, uh, period, periodizing or new periods in the in the expansion of the world system, isn't it? But anyway, the question is about world ecology. Should you expand it uh, a bit more, so so we know its implications. <laughs> Thank you.
So world ecology is a conversation that involves artists, activists and organizers, and scholars from across the disciplines. And for us, the, the point is to generate modes of knowledge that are appropriate for the unfolding crisis of capitalism, which is amongst other things, a climate crisis understood as not only the geophysical moment of rising carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, but also the climate crisis as a moment of capitalism's ethical crisis as a, and a moment of what I call the, cli the crisis of the climate class divide, where, one, where eight people own as much wealth as the bottom 3.6 billion, a crisis of, the, of climate apartheid, a crisis of climate patriarchy. And this, believe it or not, comes out of, in a dynamic way, the work of Emmanuel Wallerstein. Now, Wallerstein is gone now, uh, so let me say that Wallerstein is almost universally misread when he is read at all. So Wallerstein was, to my knowledge, the first Marxist historian to understand that the climate um, changes of the Little Ice Age in the 14th century were a significant and decisive moment of the crisis of feudalism. This is true even though over a century before Wallerstein publishes The Modern World System in 1974, Marx and Engels insisted in their outline of historical materialism that we must set out from the natural bases of climatic change and other geographical questions uh, of the web of life and how humans create class societies, modes of production, through the web of life. This is their explicit and direct argument, and I encourage anyone listening to this to go back to Marx and Engels and the German ideology and look at how they begin their discussion of historical materialism with the web of life and its intersections, its, its intimate entanglement with modes of production. So Wallerstein is universally misread, and I would say, I, I, I guess I read Wallerstein's uh, uh, work a little bit differently, where I don't, I don't think that he, as a place for a fully developed capitalism. For Wallerstein is writing out of the perspective of the philosophy of internal relations, and that's, a, that's an abstract philosophical discussion we could get into, but essentially he sees capitalism as becoming. And that this argument is a fundamental critique of systems theory. That what Wallerstein was doing was not systems theory, and that's not what I'm doing either. Systems theory was a body of thought that grew up around management theory and uh, directly uh, out of the uh, American military industrial complex uh, in uh, post-World War II, uh, uh, after World War II. So we want to be careful that we are not indulging in the systems theory either of that era, perhaps most famously for environmentalists of Donella Meadows, and her colleagues in the Limits to Growth from 1972, but that is very much the spirit of the Anthropocene systems theory approach. And it's absolutely fascinating to me that many scholars in the humanities who, who dislike Christine because he is supposedly a systems theorist embrace the Anthropocene discourse, which is a systems theory discourse, and we'll get into that. But what world ecology strives to do is to put squarely before the bar the, the questions of the domination of domination of racism, sexism, imperialism, and other forms of domination are intimately entangled with the accumulation of capital. And therefore there is the dynamic of cheapening in a sense of domination, of devaluation of say women's work, but also that these moments of domination and class structure and class struggle are themselves connected with each other, always with and within definite webs of life. So in other words, we have these three moments of domination and power, of capital accumulation and class, and of the web of life. They are all entangled. They are co-producing each other in the, uh, in the web of life, uh, as we all must uh, live and breathe and eat and uh, do interviews on Zoom. Uh, you've, you've, you've gone to the next question, which was about Chip nature and the poor chips, right? It's in a way a way of uh, stating an idea that I think it's uh, 
comes from a certain uh, Marxist tradition in the in the likes of Rosa Luxemburg, etc., uh, which redefine primitive accumulation as not as a single moment in history, but something that has to be happening continuously. There has to be an external, uh, uh, something external to capitalism in order to feed it. Uh, that is, uh, uh, dispossession and production go hand in hand and cannot be separated. Economics and power go hand in hand. And this allows us to, to actually think about a lot of uh, uh, alliances within different movements uh, nowadays because, because of that. But uh, should you expand a bit on, the, on these four chips, <laughs> this uh, uh, chip nature, chip labor, uh, what does it mean and, uh, and how it sort of gets together uh, different political conceptions that were all or are all still a bit scattered around. So there are two registers to the argument that capitalism is a system of cheap nature, and I've already hinted at these. One is cheap in the sense of to cheapen in the English language sense of the term. The German translation of uh, my book with Raj Patel is wonderful because it is devaluation. So there is cheap in an ethical and political and cultural sense that is about domination in the devaluation of the work of, to quote Maria Mies, of women, nature, and colonies. So, so the essence of capitalism as a system of domination is to cheapen the lives and labors of humans and the rest of nature in the interests of accumulating capital. So obviously, if one can pay a worker a dollar an hour instead of $10 or $50 an hour, all things being equal, that capitalist will uh, earn a greater profit, will be able to exploit surplus value that much more effectively. Now that is that goes back to an older uh, concept that has been floating around the left. And there is, of course, in the Spanish language, uh, uh, a brilliant scholar whose name escapes me right now who does write about something called super exploitation. I mean it in a slightly different sense, which is that in the Anglophonic tradition, super exploitation comes out of an understanding that the dynamics of racism and sexism and colonialism induce an, an additional increment of unpaid work and surplus value that goes, that enables the endless accumulation of capital. So that's one moment of it. The other moment of cheap nature is of course to cheapen in price not for you and I, but for the world's 1%. So cheap nature is, uh, in the sense that we talk about it, includes, as you mentioned, the four chiefs, labor, food, energy, raw materials. And every great wave of capital accumulation from the 16th century all the way to the present has depended on a significant expansion of food, energy, raw materials, and, and labor and also a significant cheapening of those crucial elements of production. Now, this is not, however, a simple environmentalist story of exhaustion and degradation. To be sure, all life, including human life, can be exhausted and degraded in a physical sense. But we are also talking about the cheapness as a battleground. Cheapness is a signifier of the worldwide class struggle, which of course has to be conceptualized in terms that go beyond an old fashioned sense of the industrial proletariat and bourgeoisie. Uh, and that's also central to the arguments of world ecology that capitalism is really about mobilizing work in a diversity of forms across the boundary of paid work and unpaid work. And so for us, that means the strategic pivot of women's domination, especially in order to ensure that capitalism does not have to pay its own costs of reproduction. And that's the dirty secret of endless accumulation. Don't pay your bills. And uh, to summarize me, yeah, like uh, your, your point, this is this division between the uh, the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene, which I, I find very important, and it will be uh, I think it will be can be very fruitful for the future 
And in a way, I think it's a, at least the first time I've read it since like a feeling we had, uh, many of us had with, uh, with ecologism, like um, there was something missing. There was something missing that was extremely important. And you can see it when, when all these uh, narratives of the ecological crisis as taken as a sort of uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, sort of uh, flies all over us in the same way is uh, are are actually uh, uh, written or uh, or spoken from the first person of plural our mode of life uh, whose mode of life is responsible for i mean uh, there is mm, a lack of uh, of research also in terms of difference of uh, uh, consumption and energy, uh, energy and resource consumption within our societies, within our cities, uh, there are, compared to the to, to all this research that there is in terms of global inequalities, which there is like the the, the carbon footprint or the ecological footprint, where we can compare the United States taken as a whole with India taken as a whole. Then we can sort of uh, extrapolate all the all those inequalities and take them to our cities, but but. Yeah, but there was that lacking. That who is the subject of the of the of the political ecology? Because uh, this first person of plural, this uh, uh, the earth against the hu against humans is not really. There is something missing there, and there is something and and, and something else. You think uh, ecological economics are responsible in a, in, a, in a way for this 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 uh, sort of. Uh, creation of a completely isolated uh, both sectors of uh, you know our life in terms of uh, of ecology and of politics that, that like the ecology is some someone that represents the mother earth as a subject which is very strange or has been very strange until now mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. can you in that frame can you can you can you can you talk about this division between capitalism and anthropocene <laughs> So Anthropocene really leads two lives, and one is a specialized geological argument. That's an argument about so-called golden spikes or stratigraphic signals in the layers of the Earth's crust. And I think that's a valuable, important, and indeed indispensable field of knowledge. When, however, the uh, practitioners and advocates of the Anthropocene deploy a geological and scientific term to understand human history, they are uh, directly embodying the spirit of Malthus. And for Malthus, the com uh, Malthus reduced the questions of the class struggle and a class inequality, and indeed of uh, uh, proletarian and anti-colonial revolt then brewing everywhere across the Atlantic world when he was writing. He reduced all of those questions to man versus nature. This is uh, Nature's Mighty Feast in the famous uh, exposition from, uh, uh, from the first, or maybe the second essay, I can't recall at the moment. So they are going squarely back to, as you put, you put it very well, of man versus nature. And Malthusianism appears and recurs during moments of profound proletarianization and revolt in the world. First in the 1790s, this is the era of the Haitian and French revolutions, of Shays' Rebellion, of many, and of open uh, kind of early proto-socialist working class uh, organizing so-called Spencean radicalism in England at the time, not to mention the revolt of the Irish, the great fear of the English ruling class. Uh, Malthus is very much channeling the anxiety and fear of the uh, British ruling class at this moment. This, this way of thinking, this deployment of science or natural philosophy into the realm of human affairs occurs again, in, uh, uh, most famously after 1883 with eugenics. And eugenics appears as a governing scientific ideology across the advanced capitalist world at the time, which is characterized by massive immigration, especially in the United States, receiving immigrants from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe 
who were not regarded as civilized, not proper for, for, for good society, and were not regarded as white. They were a real danger to the American white republic at the time. And eugenics had a long history that was only, uh, that only went underground after, uh, the, the, uh, uh, after Nazism and the Soviet destruction of Nazism in 1945. So, uh, and then again, it recurs in 1968 uh, in the form of Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb, uh, to which Anthropocene's thinking is directly and immediately indebted. So this is the erasure of the problems of class justice and of the worldwide class struggle of anti-colonial revolt in favor of man versus nature and population. When Ehrlich goes to Delhi in 1965, he writes famously about the feel of population. He doesn't feel the boot heel of British imperialism on the necks of the Indian people for two centuries. He feels overpopulation. So the problem of worldwide anti-colonial and proletarian re re uh, revolt is dissolved into the ether of the population bomb and neo-Malthusian thinking. Now, what all of these have in common is essentially a version of what James Ferguson, the famous anthropologist, calls the anti-politics machine. Ferguson writing about so-called development or development policy in the global south uh, talks about how development projects become reduced to technocratic governance. The politics is taken out of it, even though it is obviously a political project. This is the same for the Anthropocene. The so-called popular Anthropocene, the non-geological Anthropocene, is an anti-politics machine designed to contain the, uh, uh, the ongoing uh, class fractures of the world and the simmering revolt that is and has been now for, uh, for over a decade breaking out all over the world in response to capitalism's world ecological crisis. That is the multiple fractures of food and power and climate and poverty and everything else. And so when we look at the Anthropocene, we want to look at these older histories of essentially geocultural counterinsurgency. That is the deployment of scientific and naturalistic philosophies and discourses to, uh, re, uh, to essentially let capitalism off the hook for its crimes against humanity and its crimes against the web of life. Let's focus on, you know, for many years on, since almost the beginning of the 2000s, we've been increasingly listening uh, this, this mantra about this new green capitalism in different forms. Normally it's, it's also a green Keynesianism, uh, which is uh, right now, it's, it looks like it is no longer one alternative path for capital, but seems to be the only one right now at this very moment uh we of course we don't know if it will uh you know the, this green new deal that the european commission is is yeah i i suppose there are quite big difference between the united states and europe in this one and united states is still so sort of, uh, sounds like a left wing uh meme <laughs> the green new deal when the, whereas here is is our uh, uh it may sound like like uh, uh, it is just another technocratic program, but in a way, it's, it sounds to me like the same movement uh, uh, capital did with uh, with uh, uh, within Keynesianism, Fordism, incorporating the labor force inside. I mean, uh, it's a way of saying of of reacting to the uh, to the disappearance of cheap work or cheap nature in this very case, but it seems like capital has already reacted in its very, very li little scope of, of, uh, of moving in this sort of uh, uh, epochal crisis, but it, it is moving towards there and it's going to have effects in terms of organizing our societies. And uh, do you think uh, uh, the political ecology such as, as it is today is uh, prepared to confront that because as we have seen the debate has been one about uh, either green new deal or uh, degrowth 
which seems to be a bit of a not alternative from the point of view of capitalism, isn't it? Right, in, indeed. That uh, uh, the the kernel of uh, wonderful insight of degrowth is that it responds directly to capitalism's ongoing secular stagnation, not only in terms of the global accumulation of capital and world economic growth, but as I've been pointing out for a number of years, the ongoing stagnation of agricultural productivity growth, uh, in part a political dynamic, in part an herbicide technical problem, in part a climate problem, and then perhaps most decisively the non-appearance of, non of an automation revolution. That we were told in the 1970s that what awaited us in the future was a world of robot factories. Instead, we got the global sweatshop. And uh, indeed, we might reflect on that moment of the 1970s, the high tide of social democratic, Euro-communist uh, uh, influence, uh, not just in, in Western Europe, but indeed, in a sense, worldwide. Uh, and to look at the kinds of responses meted out to those social democratic and left socialist projects worldwide by capital in that period. Uh, perhaps not starting, but most famously uh, beginning in the 1970s with uh, the overthrow of Allende's government in 1973 by the United States. So when we look at the possibilities for a left Green New Deal, we are brought squarely and directly onto the terrain of an immediate confrontation with capital. The lines will be particularly sharp, perhaps even more than in the 1970s. Recall that in 1974 to 75, uh, the world economy enters into a long stagnation, the, great, uh, the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression. And it is precisely in that context that capitalism's counter-revolution begins to gather force. And in some places that was rather peaceable, as in the case of uh, uh, Olaf Palma's social democratic government. In other places, it involved the connivance of the MI6 and the overthrow of Wilson's uh, labor government in the UK and the Queen of England in the uh, uh, deposition of the Whitlock government in Australia. But across the global south, it meant ruthless and bloody terror everywhere. This was the origins, as Naomi Klein tells us, of the shock doctrine. So in other words, those opponents of global capital and the imperialist forces in the world were subject to uh, ongoing state terrorism, uh, uh, torture, uh, and the reign of terror that ensued, uh, especially but not only in Latin America. Uh, Indonesia is a, is a precocious early example of that in 1965, where the U.S. backs the killing of three million Indonesians associated with the Communist Party. So in other words, we need to be clear that as capital enters into a moment of secular stagnation in a powerful way, as the possibilities for accumulating capital become um, more and more limited, there is, well, there is the classic zero-sum situation long identified by so sociologists of revolution. That is, when a ruling class cannot bargain its way out of a, of a crisis and the peasants and workers are unable to survive in their present political condition, you have a revolutionary situation. And we need to look, I'm not, I'm not saying that we are all going to the barricades tomorrow, but I am saying that if we are talking about social democratic politics, one version leads to an accommodation with capital and as you point out, a technocratic regime most likely one that reinforces the climate class divide through, well, especially through green energy. And the, the billionaires and the hedge funds are ready for a Green New Deal with uh, a massive public investment in, in green so-called green energy. How green it is, is uh, de uh, deserves inspection. But the other possibility is something that really does not resemble at all the New Deal of the United States in the 1930s, which is a significant turn towards collectivizing social reproduction and decommodifying social reproduction, especially in healthcare, childcare, education, and as people like Daniel Aldana Cohen have been saying, in rebuilding the cities, uh, which are potentially the greatest 
for lack of a better term, the greatest opportunities for making life more sustainable in terms of, of uh, uh, realizing very large uh, uh, socio-ecological efficiencies of daily life. So there are two Green New Deals. One is a, about accommodation and ultimately about enriching the 1%. The other brings all of the movements, the environmentalist, indigenous, labor, and other movements into a direct confrontation with capital. Has, have you, of course, the eruption of uh, COVID in a way fits perfectly to your, uh, uh, the arguments you put for were in the capitalism in the web of life, but have you made some a specific work on, on how, how to read the, the new situation from the point of view of, uh, of your point of view of capitalism? <laughs> Well, I am a very slow thinker. I will make a confession to everyone. And I make sense of current events uh, much slower than some of my brilliant uh, colleagues. Now, that's perhaps as mealy mouth, but I would point to my, my colleagues like Rob Wallace, who has been, in my view, articulating the most sophisticated uh, epidemiological class power-centered explanation and, and interpretation of the crisis. I would also look as ever to Mike Davis, who has been updating his work from almost uh, 15 years ago on the avian flu, that wonderful little book, A Monster at Our Door. And so I am learning along with everyone else, but I think the, the point that I made in Web of Life is that certainly, we, this was in 2015, we are going to see questions of disease, and uh, come in in a major way because of the profound global transformations of the biosphere, the profound immiseration of, uh, at a minimum, 3.6 billion people on the planet, and the uh, exhaustion of any sense of, of social protection um, for the vast majority. So the conditions are ripe for uh, moments of epidemiological disaster. Now, so far, COVID has been contained up to a point, and I'm not trying to minimize anything. I mean, contained relative to what I often go back to, which is the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century, which was a signal moment of the crisis of feudalism. And that older link between climate class power and disease, which was very much there present at, at, with the arrival of the Black Death, which persists and recurs for centuries, by the way, but the arrival of the Black Death uh, and that, that trinity of class, climate, and disease very much uh, is useful to think about the present moment of pandemic capitalism and how that's impacting class relations worldwide. We can already see, and I don't want to overstate this, we can already see in the United States that there has been an extraordinary uptick in working class organizing, in strike activity. And although it's not well connected in any formal sense with the upsurge uh, in revolt against the white supremacist uh, uh, capitalist regime that governs the United States. That's a very dangerous and potent uh, cocktail for the American ruling class because the central principle of the American ruling class from the 17th century has been whatever we do, we must keep black and white workers apart. And the pandemic is now bringing black and white workers in various ways together in ways that are potentially explosive. Yeah, but I will ask you a, a, a last question. This one is, come, is completely personal. It's, two things that have happened recently that I think can change very much the political and economical panorama we're talking about. The first one is China declaring that they want to be carbon neutral by 2060, which of course is not very important in terms of if it's going to be carbon neutral or not, but the message is something like saying, you're gonna go for this, uh, a new niche of accumulation in terms of uh, the Green New Deal or green capitalism. Well, we want that as well. And we're going to compete that as well. So forget about an easy, <laughs> like forget about an easy way to the, to the 
reanimation of the process of accumulation. And uh, uh, I think that, that that is very, 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 very important because also, I, I remember when I started working in, in uh, I mean, I, I was in the in the team that made the first report on jobs and uh, ecology in Spain, and uh, then it was called the new industrialization, right? Uh, we were going mm. to to actually manufacture the electric car, which is no longer possible, <laughs> and uh, same thing with windmills, which Spain for a moment was a, a, a leading power, right? And due to massive financialization, it just Mm, uh, blown without having any trace of new production of uh, you know like uh, eolic and sun energy in in Spain and the other the other thing that I find extraordinarily important and it looks to me like uh, well, we know now that in 1973 uh, uh, the uh, the abandonment of the gold standard and the uh, uh, rise in oil prices is completely related. Uh, the uh, commodity that backs the dollar is oil, mm -hmm. right? And it has been so all over this time. Yes. Which, and so uh, don't you think that this movement by Saudi Arabia right at the beginning of the, of the pandemics perfectly calculated the uh, uh, going for the war on prices, just breaking the whole uh, system, uh, energy uh, energy price setting system from from after 1973, looks to me like an equally important moment that is opening up uh, destructive competence in the energy sector, which was monopolistic until that very moment. <laughs> And this may change a lot the way the world is structured. Don't you think so? Well, indeed, that, that uh, I think what you're what you're pointing at is exactly correct. That there has been a very very tight link between the U.S. dollar and uh, oil oil commodities. So we are very much in a world governed by the petro standard or the oil standard instead of the gold standard. Uh, and then what it points to is, is also entirely correct that American dollar hegemony is now on the verge of cracking and crumbling. And that can happen very, very fast. Your comments about, the, about China, I think are instructive because the Chinese have been preparing now for well over a decade for the end of dollar hegemony. And I think, Belt and Road and other uh, projects of the Chinese Communist Party, which of course is a full, well, is a contradictory unity for sure, is, is governed by capitalist rotors, as Mao used to say at the moment. But there are, are dynamic tensions within the Communist Party as well. But in my view, the, those capitalist rotors are preparing for a post-capitalist future. Now, when I say a post-capitalist future, I don't mean uh, that uh, Soviets will appear everywhere and that we will have social democracy everywhere. We can have a post-capitalist, there can be and perhaps will be a post-capitalist future in which there are still world markets, there are still uh, 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 proletarians everywhere, but it is a system essentially governed by political power. So this would resemble, of course, pre-capitalist civilizations, uh, especially those in South and East Asia, uh, uh, what Samir Amin used to call tributary formation, so based on the political uh, movement of the surplus. But for all of those so-called pre-capitalist civilizations, all of the features of, or not all, but many of the features of capitalist modernity were present. Proletarianization, uh, finance capital, commodity production and exchange, all of that. So when we look at what, what comes next, we could indeed imagine a kind of Chinese vision for transforming the capitalist world ecology into some other kind of tributary world ecology or tributary civilization. Now that's very provisional. My own sense is that, that the way that major civilization, civilizational transitions occur resembles in a way the, the crisis of, of the Roman Empire in late antiquity, 
where one part of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, survives and is able to adjust to the military and climatic and class um, transformations of the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries. In Western Europe, the, uh, the confluence of uh, peasant revolt, barbarian invasion, political crisis, and climate change leads to a very different outcome, which in my view is very hopeful, which is the outcome of a peasant-dominated civilization or a peasant-dominated mode of production in which there was a golden age for peasants in Western and Central Europe. And the end of, of uh, Western Rome, it meant the end of a mass slave society, one of the greatest slave societies in human history. So when the left uses phrases like eco-socialism or barbarism, I say, no, thank you. I am in favor of barbarian ecologies. I, I, I will continue talking to you for, for hours, but, but, but uh, let's hope we can do it when you, when you arrive in Spain. I would love that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, we will be in touch. Okay, sure. Okay, Bye. thank you. Bye.